Good morning, party people, and welcome to Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, one of my favorite places uh, on Earth. Ranks right up there with Iceland, I think. Down here on vacation at the very tip of the Baja Peninsula, it's what they call the end of the world. There's a really beautiful arch down here. It's where the Sea of Cortez meets the Pacific, the Pacific Ocean. And so it's tons of sea life out there. You'll probably see fishing boats drive past, although it, it is a little late here. It's already 7.30 a.m. Most of the fishing boats go flying past uh, first thing in the morning. Um, it's just a beautiful place, and it's actually right now uh, cooler than it is in Las Vegas. It's uh, like 10 to 15 degrees cooler, sometimes 20 degrees cooler Fahrenheit uh, than it is in Las Vegas. So it's actually a really nice place to get away. So let's go take a look at your top voted questions from PollGab. The top voted question is from Opportunity Knocking, who asks, what are your thoughts on when to use NoSQL over a traditional relational database? The short answer is that anytime you don't need joins, if you're not joining between tables together in a complex schema, like joining together uh, lots of relationships to get the data that you need to render every web page, uh, then uh, NoSQL tends to make a lot more sense. Um, anytime you're uh, looking at storing keys and values, for example, if you just need to get a customer's shopping cart, you say, here's the customer ID, give me back everything that's in their shopping cart, like a list of IDs, then NoSQL is just a total no-brainer. There's a lot of gray area in between those two extremes, but if you find that you don't need any joins whatsoever, you should be using NoSQL. Next up, Swiss DBA says, I've got a table with 8 million rows, 2 gigabytes of data, clustered index on a GUID column. I think my inserts are slow because SQL Server has to fit them in between uh, in existing rows. So for starters, I would challenge that assumption. What makes you think that A, inserts are slow, and B, it's because of that, the jamming in between columns or in between rows? Prove that out. Do a load test with a different data uh, table structure. And what you usually find isn't the clustered index design. It's those large number of non-clustered indexes that you have. Because after all, those are getting inserted in random order too, and you can't do anything about that. If you have an index on customer name, for example, customers aren't signing up in alphabetical order. They're signing up in kind of random order. So make sure to test out that assumption. I don't think you're actually correct. Next up, my tea got cold asks, you recently said that your Hecaton clients are trying to get off. He says the Hecaton faults are well known. What changed between when they started using it and now? So here's the thing. A lot of people don't read limitations before they start using something. I know that you are smart and attractive and you smell fantastic. You would never make that mistake. But believe it or not, some people start using database features without finding out what the problems are. Little dirty secret. Some of them don't even read the documentation. That's also most of them. Keeps people like me in business. Going to places like Cabo on vacation. Next up, Tim Rogers asks, I have a 90 terabyte database in AWS. The tables are partitioned across 100 file groups for ease of index maintenance. I question that. I would like to consolidate to a single data file group because we don't do anything that benefits from multiple file groups. Do you have any thoughts? You'll very often hear me say on this uh, webcast, what's the problem you're trying to solve? It doesn't sound like there's a problem today. It sounds like you don't like the number of file groups, but what's the problem that that's causing? If you think that it's slow performance, go restore that data to another server, make your changes that you wanna make and see if that improves performance. Most of the time, it won't. In this particular example, most of the time, end users aren't going to see any kind of noticeable performance difference. 
And to make matters worse, what you're suggesting is going to be a massively invasive operation, talking about redoing all kinds of file groups and files, huge pain in the rear for end users while this is happening. Even on Enterprise Edition, there are going to be some things that require you to do manual work. This isn't a push it and uh, push a button and 10 seconds later things happen kind of a, a operation. This is a weeks of planning, weeks of work after hours and on the weekends. It's going to break your availability groups. It's going to break database mirroring. It's going to blow your transaction log shipping, your tr uh, transaction log files huge because of all this work that you're explaining that you want to do is all logged, I don't think you're going to see a massive difference at the end of that. And the place that I would start is your weight stats. Look at what your SQL Server's top weight stats are and focus on the ways that you can reduce that weight stat. Odds are with a 90 terabyte database, even if you're seeing storage weights, which you might actually be, you're not going to see any kind of difference whether it's in a bunch of file groups or whether it's in one file group, whether it's across, you know, your bigger problem there is going to be the throughput that you can get on any cloud provider uh, for a relatively, uh, unless you go with really high CPU instances, your storage throughput just isn't going to be that great. And the number of files has nothing to do with it. Next up, Kevin asks, I'd like to learn Amazon Aurora, but my current company isn't using Amazon at all. What's the best and cheapest way to, re to learn Amazon Aurora? Okay, so you have two questions in here. What's the cheapest way? Read the documentation. <gasps> I didn't want to hear that. It's not very good. Okay, so then the best way to learn it would be to hire someone to meant to tutor you one on one. But Brad, that's expensive. You're right. Because if you ask me what the best cheapest car would be, you know what? It doesn't work that way. The cheapest car isn't the best, and the best car isn't the cheapest. But Brad, I I want the perfect mix of both. That's up to you and what your wallet is, how much you're willing to spend in order to learn something that your company's not even using. I wish I had a silver bullet answer for that, but welcome to learning. This is what learning is. Next up, Sad But True asks, hey, Brent, who's the Brento in the Postgres community? So I, I actually thought a lot about that because I got that question from clients and I couldn't find one. It's not that there aren't people who are active in the Postgres community, but I haven't seen one person in the Postgres community who does videos, training classes, consulting, open source scripts, and blogging. There are people who've done some of those off and on for short bursts, but nobody who does it really consistently, and that's exactly why I started going into Postgres. You can see more about that at smartpostgres.com. Roddick asks, when was the last time you faced a query so poorly written that you had to have a drink before fixing it? What was so bad about it? Uh, it was about two weeks ago. And uh, the, I brought it up on screen with the client. We were looking at which queries ran the most often, were consuming the most resources. Um, I brought it up on the screen with the client, and I, because I, I saw it in a monitoring tool, we were looking at monitoring to see which were the most expensive queries, most resource-intensive queries. And this one is really high on the list, so we uh, go and take a look at what's going on with that. And I open the code, and I had it just up on the screen, and I was like, I said to the client, look, do, do you all see what's here on this screen? They're like, yeah. I said, do you, do you understand what's wrong with this? They went, yeah. I said, How did this ever make it to production? It was so spectacularly bad. So the idea was basically that they had a table that had like, say, for example, it's live sessions. You know, live sessions, you only want to keep a small amount of history in that table. You don't need sessions from three weeks ago. Those people have timed out or are no longer logged in. So it was only supposed to have a small amount of data in this table. And the, the query involved was a delete job that would go through and delete old sessions. And it was basically a cursor that said, go open up all those sessions over then say 48 hours 
and go through one by one and delete them. But the code to do the delete was commented out. So this job to clean out the tables continuously ran, looping through rows, not actually doing anything to the rows. This table was getting giant in terms of size, had like six months or 12 months worth of session history in it. Uh, and nothing was being done by that. And this poor delete query was just using CPU continuously looping through rows and not doing anything with them. I was like, I'm so pissed at whoever thought that this was okay to comment that out and put it into production. That tells me so many things about a company's change control, about their not knowing what queries are the most resource intensive, because even the most cursory look would indicate that that was a problem. Now, so I got angry on the call with the client. I was like, this is a letdown. You, this is disgusting. You, whoever's, whoever did this should be deeply ashamed. This, I don't care if it was an accident. That was wrong. Um, and so, you know, the good news is, is that those kinds of things are real easy to fix. The bad news is, is that it's just, it's, it just makes you feel terrible when you find things like that. It's disgusting. Uh, we'll do one more. Yokel asks, what are the top issues you see when storing and searching uh, XML and JSON in the SQL Server? It's very CPU intensive for SQL Server. If you didn't index it, string processing is very CPU intensive. So I see people storing stuff as XML and JSON in the tables uh, and then going through and running queries against it saying, find me the uh, one JSON value or one JSON file that has this key value combination. And poor SQL Server is just uh, CPU intensive shredding through all the strings in the table trying to find them. It sucks bad. Um, so select performance when you're filtering for specific XML and JSON would be the big uh, overhead there. Um, and just frankly, if you're doing that, you can index XML. You can't really index JSON in SQL Server without doing some computed column tricks. Uh, and they don't work if you just want to randomly query different keys and values. Inserting is quick. Deleting is quick. Updating is quick. Um, uh, if you know the exact row number you want, that's quick. But as soon as you start querying them, you're screwed. All right, so there's a handful of questions there. It is now about time for my breakfast to arrive. Believe it or not, this hotel has a floating breakfast. I debated whether or not I was going to film the video with the floating breakfast here in here. But frankly, I think that there would be a much higher chance that you would see more of my body. And that's not what you come here to see, at least not to this YouTube channel. So I will catch y'all on the next Office Hours. Adios.